probably must have been uh, seven years old or something when I could uh, walk down to the lake and use a hand line to catch sheephead and croaker or over to the pier. And uh, I didn't have the money to go on to pier, but I fished through the drainage holes and caught croaker and brought the bucket back full of croaker and sold them for three for a quarter or something to my neighbors. <laughs> I lived on Iris Street, which is probably, today is right next to the, would have been about where the Kravis Center is, I believe. Uh, I was a block from Palm Beach High School. Mm -hmm. And all we did back then was walk wherever we went, except until I got my bicycle. <laughs> my first rod was a, uh, well, somebody gave me a split bamboo rod when I lived in Layton's Park, which didn't last long, and then I got the Shakespeare Wonder Rod, which you could get at Montgomery Ward's for about $9, but that was my first rod. Yes, and you had the little cheap plastic reels for about $4 that didn't last till the first jack you caught every shot, and I finally invested in about a $20 Fluger reel, which I had for years. <laughs> but we caught snook and, and jack and everything on them, no drags, uh, you just your thumb. I fished mostly from the sea walls. That was the only place I could, and, and a few docks that were here. Uh, a lot of the lake back then was mangroves. You could just wade out in different places and, and catch redfish and trout and snook and jacks. Uh, some of the jacks that, that along the sea wall before I had a little rod and reel, I used to fish with a with just a cane pole and a feather. Uh, I wasn't big enough to hold on to them. <laughs> they take the cane pole away from me. <laughs> uh, Eighth Street Dock was there, uh, and the uh, city docks were there. Of course, they didn't want you to fish on them as a kid. They usually run you off, but but you could get out there and catch some snapper and sheephead before they said, "Hey, kid, get out of here." <laughs> the city docks were right downtown where they are now, more or less, uh, and uh, you had the seawall that ran from. Uh, Flagner, the Royal Palm Bridge to the fishing club here and then it ended. Uh, and then you could go up there where 8th Street Dock was, there was a little seawall, and then the rest of the lake almost was just mangroves and uh, grass flats. All the way up to, uh, to beyond Layton's Park, once you got beyond uh, Singer Bridge, it was all, all grass flats, no homes. Uh, uh, US-1 was the lake and the marsh and stuff came up to US-1. There was nothing there in that area, just a big fishing area. Oh, well, I was in Layton's Park during the war years. Uh, we moved to uh, downtown Iris Street later, uh, but I went to Rivera Beach School in like the second grade or third, I guess, something like that. And uh, uh, it, it was the, uh, it, it was the fishing center back then. That was where the charter boat fleet was, Layton's Park. Well, it was a big trailer park. It was a, a place to live, and then they had the fishing, fishing dock for all their charter boats tied up. They had a small restaurant, which my mother was cook at, and I was bottle washer when I got out of school. Uh, the docks were uh, full of big snook. And every, you can see snook everywhere. Zone. I never had a, a line big enough to hold one back then. And uh, they had a big fish house where the commercial boats came in and sold their mackerel and kingfish and bluefish. Uh, there was a fleet of boats there on either side of it that were commercial boats. That's, that's pretty much, I mean, it, the lake was so clean back then at the end of the, at the, end of the dock you could, you could catch mutton snapper. Uh, big mutton snapper. You could see grouper and jewfish around the docks, uh, and snook were just layering the bottom, just thick. <laughs> there, wow. there was a whole group of people that came from up north, and they had these little, uh, little in boards that they they kept there, like a three horsepower Briggs and Stratton engine and a 14 foot boat, and they would troll the lake with spoons, uh, and in the in the summertime they would catch all the fish we get today, except in quality, uh, uh, quantity, uh, like grouper and, and jack and redfish and trout. And then in the wintertime, they had a regular small commercial, same boats that fished for mackerel and bluefish in the turning basin and drug mops and stuff. And they'd fish the whole season in there, the whole winter season. 
A mop is a, uh, Tony has said he made a mop and he made a spoon. It's just a uh, uh, piece of uh, a chain like you used to use for your grain plugs on your sink. It's kind of severated, if I'm saying it right, and they just ran thread through it and it looked like an eel. It would be like about 10 or 12 inches long. It would look like an eel and that's what you caught bluefish on. There was a lot of pompano and stuff. I don't think many people, they weren't that popular fish, I don't think, when I was a kid. But uh, I fished many years in the lake and caught a lot of pompano. Uh, I mean, just back then, everything was grass flats up there. You could, you could get big conk off the grass flats. Peanut Island was, had a shoreline that came out 100 yards at low tide that was at low tide, it was a massive amount of fiddler crabs. It looked like the land was moving. There were so many fiddler crabs back then. And all the lake was that way, just about. It, at low tide, you had grass flats and everything you could walk out on, not like today. <laughs> there, were, there, there were on either side of uh, the Blue Heron Bridge. Uh, there was about three of them stretched out there where uh, Hudgens used to be, uh, the Penders, they were all there where uh, the big yacht places, Viking, all that, there was fish houses all through there. And uh, you had a fish house right down here on the side of the bridge, which was uh, a, a seafood restaurant also, which was Hudgens. There was a big trailer park that ran from US-1, uh, which was Dixie Highway, all the way down to the lake. That was right next to where Good Sam Hospital is today and they had a fishing dock there that was just Hitchcock's, he had two charter boats and the big huge trailer park. So uh, it was, <laughs> and WJNO later on built their first tower down there, which uh, was supposed to be hurricane proof, which they bragged about in the big storm we had back in 47. <laughs> it came down <laughs> partially on the dock. <laughs> West of town, town pretty much, West Palm Beach pretty much ended it at uh, Tamarin Avenue. Uh, it was all swamp and Clear Lake, uh, which was the water supply, but uh, Okeechobee, between Okeechobee Road and 45th Street and Clear Lake was nothing but a giant swamp. There wasn't any buildings out there then. Uh, the only place uh, that was on Okeechobee Road way out there was the old Okeechobee Steakhouse, which is still there. Those swamps, uh, an old club member here, Woody Updegrove, and, and used to take me out, and later on I got an airboat, and we frogged out there and duck hunted. It was great duck hunting. And we had past club members like C.C. Anderson and Bob Kleiser and Sin that used to get, in, get out there and also do it. <laughs> Military trail back then, what, what was out there was dirt, and uh, it pretty much it ran a short distance and ended like it at Lake Park Road. It ended and then there was just a dirt road going out to the water catchment area where the beeline is today, which wasn't there back then. That was all swamp. Uh, <laughs> it was just great bird hunting of every type, snipe, duck. Dubs were in town. You didn't have to go far to get dubs. So. Uh, and uh, of course, we all hung out at Bob Kleiser's too, when we could, or George the Bay's. So we duck hunt. We'd go out and uh, set out our decoys and hide the boat and, and stand there in the water and wait for the ducks to come in. Or at night, we'd frog. We'd start in the evening there after dark. Uh, once the bugs settled down, let the dew put the bugs down, and then you could see what to do and uh, you just ride around and gig frogs. We'd get uh, 50, 50 pounds, 100 pounds at night sometimes and sell them to the restaurants. A, lo a lot of it would be uh, in the, uh, the city there between 45th Street and Okeechobee Road just past Australian Avenue. It was all a swamp. We would do that in there. Uh, there's, there was, the town didn't go very far back in, back in 1945. It, it was <laughs> all around the coast here. Uh, even people didn't even build their homes down on the water back then. Most, most of the homes were up on US-1. They, uh, they didn't build close to the water because of the hurricanes. Uh, <laughs> <didn't>. <laughs>
Well, I'm sure the fishing activities that I was pretty young back then, so I really wasn't involved too much in, in the commercial aspect of fishing and the charter boats. Uh, but I do remember that uh, we had to paint the top part of our headlights black so there wouldn't be any reflection at night. Uh, and anybody that lived close to the coast had to uh, have their shades pulled down so that no light could get out to silhouette our boat so that the German submarines wouldn't be able to see them in a silhouette. And they had uh, wardens go around and tell you if they seen any light showing, they'd, they'd have them put, put out, you know, tell you put them out. <laughs> Uh, rationing was, uh, sugar was rationed, uh, gasoline was rationed, uh, you had stamps, you had so many stamps to buy your gas and that was it. Uh, the uh, meat was pretty hard to get good meat. Uh, I was partially, back then I was on a chicken farm part time that my father had who was a manager at A&P store in town, the only one in town on 8th Street. So. We had a lot of chicken to eat, <laughs> and uh, it, it was an interesting time. Uh, Morrison Field was out here, uh, which is our airport today, uh, Palm Beach International Airport, but that was a military airport back then. Okay, we had some boats. You have pictures of them in the club, the OK uh, and uh, the Calumet. I didn't mate on that one so much. I just rode as a guest, but uh, Frank Ardine, the three brothers of the old boats, uh, for fishing over here, they had uh, the ma mahogany fishing chairs. Uh, they had didn't have refrigeration or coolers or all that. You carried your ice. Uh, they didn't have tuna towers, but all the outriggers were bamboo. Uh, I guess a popular reel back then was maybe a 603 pin or uh, something like that, and. Uh, Everybody was using linen lines. They hadn't come out with Dacron yet. So if you could buy the good Calcutta or Burma rods, uh, the distance between the joints were shorter, the ho and the hollow area was shorter, so they had less flex to them, and they were a heavier rod. But that's why they put all, this, all the spreaders and everything on long aluminum outriggers, just to, to keep them from flexing too much. Oh, I worked on the charter boats. Uh, I started out on the charter boats, and then, uh, and then I was well. My first real job was with a past director here, Jack Lance, who I met through Ann Eggleston, which was uh, had the inlet dock up there, and I started fishing with him off the Susie, over in the, over in the Bahamas. And that, that's really where I kind of got started. And then I just branched out from there to different, different people. Uh, Pete Widener here, which had the half pint. He was a member of the club. And, and I fished with uh, quite a few other people that not full time, uh, like uh, Mr. Boomhauer, uh, who had Francis McBride, ran that boat. Uh, and uh, then I just did whatever a lot of us do uh, in between jobs or when you have time off, you work on the different charter boats. Uh, <laughs> you know, there was a lot of boats there. I'm trying to remember. I don't remember them all until you mentioned the names of them, but there was a pile of boats in Rival Beach that, that we fished out of. Uh, Bev Smith's uh, Tranquil. Uh, we had to, took all the school kids out. I, I did some stuff with him. I had a story on that one where we, uh, one day they had a big lightning storm out here. Uh, he wasn't fishing the kids. He, uh, Nick Smith uh, was fishing with his father. His father had a blue marlin on. Uh, and I was coming in with Jack Lance and they didn't have a mate. And they transferred me to his boat to see if we could get that fish, which was really too big a fish to get because he had it on 20 pound tests with very light wire, like number seven wire. And we did our best, but we just couldn't, couldn't, couldn't hold a fish close enough to the boat long enough to get a gaff in it without breaking the wire. And I finally ended up, we broke the wire and got caught in one of the worst electrical storms I have ever seen. Uh, the lightning was coming down and 
hitting around us and they're just big flashes that outriggers are humming from all the electricity in them. <laughs> but we, we made it back. <laughs> the commercial kingfish started back at least in the 30s or before, uh, way back. But when I started, when I started fishing for them, uh, the fish were right out here. They were everywhere. As you could go right off of uh, Palm Beach Inlet and run out to 75 feet of water. So a lot of us didn't have fatometers in. So you just went with how the current looked and how the boils came up to tell where the reefs were and where you were. And when you did get fatometers, you would start marking fish uh, in right off of Palm Beach Inlet and you can make a drift and end up all the way up off of Jupiter and never get out of the school of fish. Uh, there was a huge fleet of boats that fished them in, much bigger than today, uh, and, and a bigger uh, private fleet of head boats and stuff back then that fished three trips a day. Uh, the price of fish back then would go down to 15 cents a pound and people would fish. That's how many fish they would bring in. But uh, I could go out myself uh, and I made a little block 10 squid with a 8 hook in it that you just put down a hand line and jig up and I could catch a thousand to 1200 pounds a day by myself in a small boat. So that, that's how many fish were out here. You could, you could look down and see the schools following your lural up. Uh, the fishing stayed very good for kingfish down here until uh, the big roller rigs came in and uh, that kind of disrupted the whole the whole thing. Yeah. Well, yes, he was at Layton's Park, uh, and he had he had an old charter boat before he got to Rival Bitch, uh, and uh, more or less the, the whole fleet was old boats back then compared to what all at once they started getting fancy. They didn't have fiberglass boats back then, uh, and they were all slow, uh, like. <laughs> Six-cylinder engines. Uh, I, I don't know. You know, the, the fishing you didn't have to go so far to catch fish back then. Uh, when I fished on some of them when I was a kid, you could just go down to the breakers and catch. Well, actually, you could catch all the amberjack or barracuda or cobia you wanted right here off the inlet, right here off the jetties. But the breakers had a famous amberjack hole, and off of Juno did too. And the sailfish were right in on the beach during the summertime. In the wintertime, they weren't. You didn't have to run real far to get to them. You know, that was uh, way back. Today, things have changed and boats range pretty far. I mean, a lot of tournaments I've fished in my older years here, we run all the way up to Fort Pierce to get in sailfish. Uh, but uh, it's, it's all different today, or even 20 years ago, it's different than it was way back when I'm talking. Mm -hmm.